Kathy and me to talk when you've got this, you know, bioinformatics meeting. And he said, well, you know, we had three days of really smart intellectual presentations and we wanted a change of pace. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here we go. Now, here's the challenge. You're, you're a lot smarter than I am. I, I didn't even understand the paper titles, um, <laughs> even though I knew some of the words. Um, but um, I like to remind people who are really, really smart about what we're learning in neuroscience about the role of the subconscious in everything we do. And to that uh, point, I like to tell people that you may think that who you see in the room right now is everybody who's here. That's not true. Every one of you, in the words of Jonathan Haidt, the founder of positive psychology, is riding an elephant. And that elephant is your subconscious. And that subconscious is pushing you around from an early, early stage. And you know who it is. It's that little voice in your head that started criticizing me the moment I got up here. What's he going to talk about? Is this just going to be a comedy act? Who is this guy? That little voice is not your learning personality. That is your subconscious bias saying, I'm not even going to read that article. It can't be right because that's not how I think. Or I'm not even going to try to check that person's work because they're so famous, why bother? Or I'm not going to tell the pilot the wing flaps are in the wrong position because he's the pilot. He ought to know better. So today we're very fortunate in that our subconscious, which makes it really hard for us to listen to each other, any of you who are married know this. It is. it is really hard to listen to somebody if you're arguing with them inside your head the moment they open their mouth, right? So I'll give you an example. So my wife and I went to a marriage therapist, and the, the, it was an imago therapy session. And that meant we had to, each of us got a turn to say what was on our mind, and the other person had to repeat it back word for word. No editing, no attitude. No, no summary, you had to repeat it back, word for word. So my wife went first, and she says, I really feel like I'm unimportant when you come home and talk about your day before you ask about my day. Right? So I'm listening. So then it became my turn, and I said, so I understand that you feel less important when I come home and talk about my day before I ask about your day, even though I had a meeting in the Oval Office today. <laughs> not allowed, not allowed. So, so here's the thing. You may not like anything I say, you may love it. That's not the important part. The important part is I want to get through to you. And we have a physical representation now of your subconscious. It's called your smartphone. Think about it. No matter what you're consciously doing, you are always interrupting yourself to look at your smartphone because the smartphone is now the representation of your subconscious. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to hand your phone to the person on your right for the next 35 minutes. You are going to hand your phone to the person on your right for the next 35 or 40 minutes. Okay? Come on, let's do it, let's do it. It's hard, isn't it? Move that elephant over one. Are you going to tweet? You can tweet for them. You can tweet for them. <laughs> now, which group do you think does it immediately? Which group that I've talked to did it immediately didn't even laugh? Yeah. <laughs> nurses, nurses, because they're trusting each other. Which group wouldn't do it? I gave a talk to a CRISPR conference. <laughs> and I said, let me get this straight. I mean, they totally rebelled. It was in Berkeley, they totally rebelled. And I said, let me get this straight. You don't trust the person next to you with your phone for 30 minutes, but you want us to trust the germline to you guys? <laughs> I mean, seriously. Would you hand your germline off to a CRISPR scientist who wouldn't let go of their phone for 30 minutes? <laughs> anyway, that's, that's the opening meta point is, 
it would go a long way to bring everybody together if we could really learn to listen to each other. And that's my cute way of getting you to pay attention. So what I want to do now is talk for just a moment about how we all got here in terms of scientific disciplines. Okay? So August Comte in the 1800s started the philosophy of positivism, which said that all the sciences have a certain evolution. Astronomy requires mathematics, chemistry requires physics, uh, biology is a science of comparison, physics is a science of experimentation, astronomy is a science, and astrophysics is a science of observation. Um, and he said that all the sciences had a certain flow to them, and we have to study each of them because the purpose of doing all of that is eventually to create the science of sociology. What do humans do and why? And that all of the sciences, and he also was one of the first proponents of scientific hypothesis and science trial and error for, for verification. Uh, his idea was if we could just study each of the disciplines and then put them back together, we would understand the human condition. Here's the problem. We hardly ever put them back together. So when I was in college, I was a history major and a psych minor, and I did a paper called The Idea of History. And the whole point of it was, you can't really understand history without really understanding psychology. And you can't understand theories of psychology without understanding philosophies of history. What does that mean? Well, the more I studied psychological theory, the more I realized that the difference between Freud and Skinner was their view of history. They were both determinists. But Freud said, your history is the determining thing, and I need to understand you back to before you were even sentient, and don't everything you've done, everything you dream is just a symbol that I'm going to turn into a language that describes your real history, and then you'll understand why you're so screwed up. And most of psychology, by the way, until the positive psychology movement, is about why are you screwed up, not why are you so good. So Freud's view was history is everything. Then comes uh, Skinner, B.F. Skinner comes along, who had his, had his daughter live in a box, and he said, I don't care about your history. Let me follow you around for a while, and I'll find out what reinforces your good and bad behaviors in your daily life. I don't need to know about your childhood or your parents or anything else. But once he did that, he still thought it was deterministic. Only the existential psychologist that said, life is a hourglass. Your past brings you to this moment, and you choose to go this way or that way. It is not determinant. It merely puts you in a situation, the existential moment, at which point you choose your future. So why am I bringing all this up? When you look at all the subject matter you have in this meeting, all the different kinds of informatics, what we're really talking about in my meager mind is the study of human informatics. The study of human informatics. Because you're looking at clinical care, public health, research, medical practice, from the standpoint of informatics, but at the end of the day, when you put it all together, and you have a person with a problem who needs it put all together. What we're really doing is studying human informatics, which goes to my last metaphysical discussion before I get into the details, which is what I call a unified theory of how data becomes wisdom. So you all know this. You may not think of it the same way I think of it, but we all, we've all heard data becomes information when you place it in context. Right? So if I said four to three, you probably would not think I'm talking about time. Because time doesn't go backwards. So if I said four to three, you probably don't think I mean, well, the meeting will be from 4 p.m. to 3 p.m., unless it's a really long meeting. And if I say 20 to 40, maybe you think I'm talking about the weather. Because I wouldn't say a score in sports with this low number first. Right? So that data becomes information in context, assuming you know the context. Well, the problem with medical data 
is that the context we're using is way too small. The context we're using is not broadly population-based. It's not broadly genomically-based. It's not broadly experientially-based. It is institution by institution, patient by patient rather than the cohort of humanity. So our context for turning data information is too narrow. And so we wonder why we have all this data and not quite enough information. Now, how does information become knowledge? Information becomes knowledge when you can use it to do something. It's practical. So what limits the ability to turn information into knowledge? And what limits it there is the practice of medicine seldom knows all the information related to what, happens, what needs to happen next. People in Memphis don't know what happened at Sloan Kettering yesterday. They probably don't know what happened at Sloan Kettering last month. Maybe not even last year, unless they just read Jammer or went to the ASCO meeting. So our information is being denied, being turned quickly into knowledge, because our practice is dis disassociated too often from the best information, and so our knowledge is limited. So we don't have the ability to quickly turn things into practice to save a life that we find out later could have been saved if we'd done one thing differently. And then finally, the big one, how does knowledge become wisdom? And what is wisdom? Well, in my rubric, wisdom is prediction. If you really know how something will work in practice, and you have enough data to know that it's meaningful in a certain context, then you are wise. You can predict what will happen. And too often in medicine, what we predict is you're going to die in six months. We have that wisdom. What we don't have is how we're going to keep you alive in six months. And that's because of all the other problems, too narrow of a context for data turning into information, too limited a practice, knowledge, what Marty Tenenbaum calls the knowledge commons, too little of that as compared to a data commons. And then our ability to predict is highly limited by the first thing, which is our context is too narrow. How do I predict outcomes in people of populations whose genetics are different from all the ones that were in the clinical trial? How do I predict outcomes for children? How do I predict outcomes from people who have bizarre lifestyles or live in environmentally awful places? We are nowhere near that yet. And that's why I say, what you're doing is really human informatics. Because you are putting it all together. That's why I'm here. I'm here because very few audiences I speak to put it all together. And we haven't had the ability, from an informatics standpoint, to put it all together until fairly recently. And when I say put it all together, the all I'm talking about is truly big data, which no institution has. Because no one institution is big enough to be big data in the minds of a computer scientist. Big data is far bigger than any hospital, and I'll come to that later. So now let me turn back to cancer. I want to tell you three stories that demonstrate why the Biden Cancer Initiative is doing what it's doing. I have a special relationship to San Francisco. I flew here on 9-10 with a change of clothes in my briefcase because I was flying home on 9-11. I gave a talk at 6 in the morning, so I didn't know everything that was going on until after my talk. And I found a hotel and I stayed here for a week. It was a Twilight Zone experience because Union Square, there was nobody, nobody on the street. I was on the street looking for underwear. <laughs> the next time I had a personal experience with San Francisco, not like Tony Bennett, um, I flew here after a physical on a Monday. I flew here on a Thursday, four years, five years ago. And I landed here at 4.30 DC time. And I thought, wow, my doctor takes Friday off. If I don't call him now, I won't know the results of my physical. And I'd had a few prostate biopsies and high cholesterol and had glaucoma, you know, old. 
My mother's 96. She's doing far better than I am. My main desire is not to disappoint my mother by dying before she does. Um, and so I call my doctor while I'm getting my bag off the overhead. You know, one of those irritating people who does that. But usually it's like, hi, I'm here. Can you pick me up? Well, of course they can. They've been waiting an hour for you in the cell phone lot. I call my doctor. I call my doctor. When you get your phone back, put that in your phone. He called his doctor. And my doctor said, I'm glad you called. Your cholesterol is better. Your PSA is fine. But by the way, you have leukemia. Now I went to public schools. That's not how we use, by the way. <laughs> right? I use by the way like this. By the way, there's some tissue paper stuck on your shoe. <laughs> by the way, you have 160,000 whiteness class. As an example of how to use the phrase by the way. So I had 160,000. Actually, by the time I got to the doctor in San Francisco, who was a friend of mine, I had 180,000. I should not have been on the plane. A CBC test takes 15 minutes. Somebody knew Monday that I had chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Nobody told me. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, nobody told me. I called my doctor. Whoa. Now, there were lots of other tests they were doing that take three or four days. So what? Right? So, yes, the system completely failed us. And if I had had a different kind of leukemia, I could very well have had a blood clot flying across the country without knowing it. Fortunately, CLL white cells are very slippery. So you only have, a, you have to be careful to not drink on an airplane, which I generally don't do anyway. So that's story number one. Story number two, which Sam alluded to, my friend Alex, the same time I was diagnosed with CLL, was diagnosed with glioblastoma multiforma. She was 40, two young children, and I knew that she probably had 18 months. She lived at 33rd and Park in New York. I was working in DC community in New York. I lived at 29th and Park. In the last six months of her life, she had to commute to Boston and back for clinical trial treatment. And she's 30 blocks from Sloan Kettering, right? And New York Presbyterian. Really? And NYU. Really? And you know somebody in Boston was commuting to New York, don't you? You know they were. So she died 18 months later, just as I finished my six months of chemo, which didn't start for me for a year. And then it started, and then I was fine, and she was gone. Another way our system fails us. Third example, my friend Bart. I was his lawyer when he sold his business to Cisco, the first computer-based voicemail system back in the 80s. He made a fortune, never worked again. He was incredibly athletic, really smart, MIT grad. He and his father thought it was fun to hang out on the beach and calculate wind speed under sails, right? <laughs> Using calculus for fun. Um, he got multiple myeloma. They gave him three years to live. Now, I know people who've been alive 20 years with multiple myeloma. Uh, that was not his situation. He knew more about multiple myeloma than most med students will ever learn. And he had a lot of money. So what happened? He funded a trial at the Hutch in Seattle. A year and a half, never got started. He gave his bone marrow tissue to Dana-Farber for a trial. They decided to halt the trial, do some more audits, and then start it up a year later. They kept the tissue. He flew across the country in the last six months of his life to go to a car -T trial at Sloan Kettering. When he got there, they said, when was your last chemo? And he said, two weeks ago. And they said, that's too recent. You have to wait. You have to fly back to see. Isn't that why we have phones and email? They waited until he shows up in pain to ask him when his last chemo was. So he flies back to Seattle, flies back later to New York. CAR-T didn't work. And he died under Washington State's death and dignity law when, as he put it on Caring Bridge, the pain of living and trying to stay alive curve dipped below the line that says it was worth it. In his last three months, his wife wrote on Caring Bridge after he died. He let the doctors, he did his own personal moonshot by letting the doctors try whatever they wanted to in his last three months of life. How many of us would be brave enough to do that? So these three stories demonstrate the failure of our data system, our clinical trial system, our medical care system, and the fact that 
unlike cancer, which is completely focused on the patient, cancer is not distracted by money, by publications, by IP, by professional jealousy, by publication schedules. Cancer is the only part of the system that's completely focused on the patient. <laughs> Think about that. So that's what I'm here to talk to you about today, is how can we fix that? How can we fix that? So let me talk about the Biden Cancer Initiative for just a minute. This is what we're doing. How did, how did that sentence come out of the Vice President's mouth? Well, I told him I was trying to explain what I do now to my mother. And I said, Mom, we're trying to get people to share medical information so people know what's going on. She says, you mean they don't do that now? <laughs> and then I said, you know, the problem with sharing it is we don't have standards for what's in the information. She says, what do you mean? I said, well, a pathology report, if you've seen one, you've seen one. They're, they differ from institution to institution. I once asked the directors of five of the biggest cancer centers in America, would you trust a pathology report from somebody other institution? And they said, I don't even trust them from my institution. <laughs> right? So my mom said, you mean they don't have standards now? I said, no. So the more I explained what I was doing, the more my mother thought I was a fool because she thought I was just plowing plowed ground. Surely they're doing all these things. No, mom, they're actually not. And then I told Vice President Biden, I said, you know, sir, I think what we're really doing here is we're trying to create the system everybody thinks we already have, except cancer patients. Cancer patients find out very quickly this is not the system they thought we had, right? You know how much notice I got to go into the hospital for my first round of chemotherapy, which lasted five days over, five days because of the cytokine storm, they wanted to make sure I didn't die from electrolytes poisoning my blood. You know how much notice I got to do that? Take a guess. 24 hours. Well, I said, he said, we need to start talking, we need to talk about treatment. I've been getting tested for a year, every six weeks. I said, okay, I'm thinking, you know, this was July, I'm thinking after my August break. I said, when do you want to start, Doc? He said, tomorrow. Yeah. Now, how many people can just take off work for a week with no notice to get chemotherapy, which you haven't even found out what it's going to cost you, if you're going to be able to function at all, which in my case I was, I had no side effects from the chemo. Think about that. I had fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, and rituxan. I had no side effects. I didn't even talk about it at the hospital because I was embarrassed. But when people say, what do you want for patients? I say, I want the same thing I got, except I want their doctor to call them instead of me calling my doctor. But I want the urgency of care and the quality of care that I got for everybody, which ain't the case. So, the Biden Cancer Initiative is not a funding organization. We're not a services organization. What we're trying to do is change the culture of research because basically it hasn't changed since World War II. When we came out of World War II, we switched the model of corporate funding of research to government funding of research, set up the NIH, set up all the processes you're very familiar with, and they have barely changed since then. Everything else in your life has completely changed. Do you go to a bank teller? Do you go to a travel agent? Do you even buy shoes at a store? Do you buy glasses at a store? Jesus, it's unbelievable. Isn't it unbelievable? You know, my, my wife says, you know, we're, we're, out of, uh, we're out of cat food. And I said, no, I'll go to the store. She said, never mind. It's being what? Now, I grew up in a grocery store. This is personally threatening. <laughs> but it's all changed except the way we do research. The fact that we still have one-year grants because that's the appropriation cycle. Mm -hmm. It just drives me out of my mind. So the Biden Cancer Initiative has divided our work to change the culture into six areas where we think we can make a difference. Prevention. These are the simplest things which therefore because of the elephant we're all riding none of us does. The HPV vaccine. Oh no, that's all about sex. Oh, oh contraire, it's one of the first incredible breakthroughs in cancer vaccines in my lifetime can prevent 98% of cancers like head and neck and, I mean, sorry, sorry throat and, and uh, uh, cervical cancer. I met a 29-year-old woman who had a complete hysterectomy from cervical cancer broke my heart. That story should not exist. And healthy eating and lifestyle. Huh. 
Whenever anybody asks me, what are we going to do about health? I'm saying you can't do anything about health unless you change the nutrition cycle, unless you change our food supply. And our food supply, and I did grow up in a grocery store, has gone from local, which it was then before it was hip, to multi-processed, multi-industrial processes so that you don't even eat well when you think you are eating well, okay? Patient navigation, yes, I was tested for a year in one wing of Sloan Kettering and then when I had to be treated, I had to go to another wing, I got lost, nobody helped me, nobody told me what was gonna happen, even at Sloan Kettering. They sit me down, put a needle in my arm and the nurse puts on a hazmat suit. I'm in shorts and a t-shirt. I thought, what is this? Is this experiment on old white man day? And so finally I said, what's going on? She said, oh, don't worry about it. Uh, post facto, I'm already worried about it. Now, there are good reasons for that. You don't want to be dripping chemo on you if you're a nurse every time you hook up the bag and you do it 20 times a day. I get that. And I'm getting it in my bloodstream, so what's a little spill? right but still be nice if somebody had said don't freak out when the nurse puts on all this gear uh, you're in shorts and t-shirt you're fine so patient navigation is the first thing we hear no matter where we are no matter who we visit with the Bidens me anybody we sit down with a group of patients doctors nurses first thing they say is we need a better system to help people know what the hell is going on and what's going to happen next and what's going to happen next and next and next. Where do you go? Where do you get the good information? Which app is really going to help you? Which diet is really going to help you? We are so far removed from that. We don't have a ways for medicine. We don't have a Google Maps for medicine. Good God, we can show you how to get inside the Marrakesh market on GPS, which I did in October. And my wife kept swearing the computer would work. And I kept saying, I don't know. I really don't want to get lost in here. But you know, it did. But it wouldn't have worked at Sloan Kettering. So we have a problem. Access to care. Not just pricing, but equity. The inequity in our cancer system kills people that we can save every day. And here's one of my main messages about access to care. Everybody's against cancer. Not everybody's for insurance. Obamacare, no matter what you think about it, put 32 million people on insurance who didn't have insurance before. The biggest determinant of who survives cancer is who has insurance. No matter what we say about all the fancy schmancy science we're doing, if people don't go to the doctor, they'll never get treated. So now five or six million more of those people have been off insurance. Medicaid was not expanded in several states. Whether you want Medicare for all is not the question. Question is, first, let's get everybody insured with the system we've got. If you're against cancer, you don't really have a choice about that. That's number one. Number two, we know that the system is really designed by zip code. I live in Bethesda, Maryland. I'm inundated with medical help everywhere. I grew up in Arkansas, in the Delta, poorest one of the poorest regions in the country. You can only get cancer in my hometown on Tuesday and Thursday. <laughs> That's the days the doctors came over from Memphis. So that's not changed in my lifetime. We have got to do a better job. And finally, price. Let me say this about price. Of course these new drugs are really expensive because when you read how they work, what do they do? First, they take stuff from you and then they engineer it to fight cancer and put it back in you. That is not a blockbuster drug where the first one cost $100 million and the next one's a penny, like software. This is a person by person, personal medicine that's really expensive. But here's the punchline. It doesn't matter what the price is. It matters what the out-of-pocket is. If we take a $300,000 CAR T therapy and we make it 100,000, and the patient copay is still 5,000, and the median income of people in Medicare who are not subsidized is $30,000 if you're white, $18,000 if you're black, $12,000 if you're Hispanic. 
How are they supposed to pay $5,000 up front in January when their income is spread all over the year and most people don't have enough savings to withstand a $500 surprise? So we can talk all we want to about price and I, believe me, I was at Pfizer long enough to know what a fuck system it is. <laughs> I once asked somebody at Pfizer, how do we set prices? They put me in a room with a woman from Turkey for four hours. And by the end of it, I was never going to ask again. <laughs> I was never going to ask again. It looked like a world tour. Well, reference pricing, and we had a map in Italy and Germany and Egypt and France. It's a mess. The problem is it's a mess that the patient pays the net price, never, I mean, the gross price never gets the benefit of the net price. It's like if you went to buy a car. And you said, I'd like to buy this Chevrolet. And how much is it? And they said, well, tell me about you. <laughs> right? What kind of insurance do you have? How old are you? Where do you go to school? I mean, are you on Medicare? I mean, imagine that. Imagine that. But that's exactly what we do with pricing. You go to the pharmacy, you pick up a drug. Well, let's see. Are you on Medicare? Do you have Medicare Advantage? You, because the price is different for every one of those. So it's not about the price, except it is about the price, but to patients, it's about the out-of-pocket. I also asked, how do you know when to stop raising prices? Because all the drug companies raise prices every quarter to meet their earnings per share. So I said, how do you decide when to raise, how to, when to stop? And they say, when doctors start calling us complaining. That's the, that's the answer. When doctors start calling us and complaining, we stop raising the price that month. Is that a system? No, that's not a system. So access to care is a big deal and it's the most complicated thing we're working with. So that's, that's gonna take a while. As I mentioned, my friend Alex should never have had to do what she did in the last six months of her life. We need to take the protocol to the people, not the people to the protocol. We're still living in an age where people think you go to, the, you go to Oz and the wizard will cure you and it can't happen where you live. That's just not true. There's, and we're working with major institutions to get them to share their protocols with other local community cancer centers without burdening the community center with the cost of doing all that. And in fact, we've hired a dedicated person to just this issue because one of our board members gave us the money to do that because he was so frustrated by what he saw as this particular inefficiency in which clinical trials are generally reserved for people with connections in big cities. And why does that matter anyway? It matters because all my life, clinical trials were not care, and now they are. It was unethical to refer to a clinical trial as a part of your care. It was a trial, an error, things could go wrong, you could die, you could get sicker. It was never intended to be about you, it was supposed to be altruistic. And now everybody without a hope says, is there a trial for me that might take care of my cancer? This is a huge switch. The other aspect of that is the pediatric space. So one of our board members who's very involved in pediatric cancer did a little survey and found out that she couldn't get any of the major pediatricians in oncology to want to do a nonprofit to try to improve pediatric clinical trials happening more often. Because they'd seen so many nonprofits try and fail. And pharma and biotech don't want to loan their drugs to nonprofits. You know, when we had the oil crisis, we didn't start the National Nonprofit Foundation to drill oil. We created incentives for people to drill oil. But if we're dealing with Alzheimer's or cancer or neoblastoma, we, we think nonprofits are the way to go. Now, I've been a nonprofit guy most of my career, but I've tried to bend the curve a little bit to be more practical. So our board members said, well, would you join a company that was doing this? And the response was, I've been waiting all my life for someone to ask me that. So she left our board, started a company, got her venture firm to fund it, and it's called Day One Therapeutics. And they're now approaching pharma and biotech companies to in-license assets that are ready for trials, they have a safety profile that pharma's no longer working on. And there are two responses. Yeah, we think we can do that, let's talk about the terms, and they're very generous terms. This isn't, even though it's a for-profit, it's the beneficiary corp, so to speak. You know the second response? I'm too busy to take the time to go over with you our, our shelved drugs 
to see if we can help save lives and children. They've gotten so many of that answer that I think they should put it in an op-ed in the New York Times. Here are the people who said they're too busy to negotiate a favorable license to them to let somebody else take the risk of saving a child's life in a clinical trial. This is a problem in our culture. It's the root problem, if I can be that bold. It's the root problem in our culture, which is the lack of empathy. And it starts at the top. I'll just leave that there. <laughs> it starts at the top. What is empathy? I was thinking about this really heavily this morning because I'm 67 years old. Nature could give a shit about me. I'm past having more children. Once you leave the age of procre procreativity, evolution could care less about you. In fact, the sooner you're in the ground to feed the flowers, the better it is for the planet, right? So I was thinking, what, what, what is my role now that I'm you know, post important to the evolution, to the selfish gene, right? And I realized that empathy is when you care for and love somebody or something that is not necessarily all about you. It's not about your self-interest. It's not your child, it's their child. It's not your mom, it's their mom. Evolution dictates that we care for our children <coughs> But it doesn't dictate we care for anybody else's. That's empathy. That is a human emotion. And except for a few dogs I've known, it's pretty much a human emotion. Certainly not a cat emotion. <laughs> I have a cat. His name is Stryker. I'll just leave it there. <laughs> and then standards. And I'm gonna, my big finish will be about data, no surprise. So what are we doing about standards? Well. You know, I'm, not, I'm getting monitored now at George Washington University because I've been back in D.C. full time. And I was talking to my doctor the other day, and he said, well, you know, you got six months of chemo at Slum Kettering, we do four months here. Think about that for a minute. Hmm. You mean I sat there for six extra days with a needle in my arm and thousands of dollars going into my veins? The cost of my treatment was this price. Who knows what it really is? was $40,000 for three days of treatment each time. I got two extra treatments according to George Washington and not according to Sloan Ketter. What's up with that, right? Why are we giving women with breast cancer chemotherapy after their treatment who don't need it? Because not everybody uses the genetic test to figure out if it's going to help them. Why is it taking us so long to figure out which order to do chemotherapy and immunotherapy and radiation when people keep using the order that doesn't work instead of the order that's been shown to work. So we're doing in standards something that's a little more technical than everything else we're doing, which is take immunotherapy. What is immunotherapy? It is an autoimmune attack that we give you to fight your cancer, but hopefully not give you diabetes and not fight your cancer. Most people would trade cancer for diabetes, but they would not add it if they had a choice. <laughs> so how do we know who to give it to and how it's working? Well, everybody in the pharma industry has to have an immunotherapy drug. It's just the, it's just the soup du jour. What's on the menu today? Immunotherapy drugs. It's children's soccer. Everybody is on the ball, and there's no one to pass to, <laughs> right? So every company, there, there are over 1,400 trials on the same thing. You know how many patients that is just in the control arm? And how are they measuring the response? With homegrown tests, company by company, they have a congruence of about 15%. So we have started with the FDA and with the National Institute for Standards and Technology and Merck and a bunch of other people and Anna Barker, the former deputy director of the NCI, a project to develop two things, an actual assay for PDL one checkpoint inhibitors of a particular kind that would be the standard to use when you're using that checkpoint inhibitor, 
derived from that a process to develop all the subsequent assays you need for all the subsequent checkpoint inhibitors and markers that we need to know about, such as tumor mutational burden and something called STK, which is a marker for non-responsiveness. It hasn't been done. This is 2019. We've known about immunotherapy, FYI, since the 1900s, when Coley, William Coley in New York, used to give his cancer patients skin infections because he observed that the people who had a skin infection lived longer with their cancer than people who didn't, and he figured out it must have provoked an immune response. And he lost to the chemotherapy industry, and that was that until a century later when we said, oh yeah, the immune system, the most powerful force in the universe. Seriously, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for the immune system, right? We're under attack all the time. If there's a God, he is a hacker, <laughs> right? He's created all these viruses and bacteria to hack us constantly. And the immune system is fighting. So without these standard assays, we don't know, as we say in the South, shit about Shinola. We don't have a clue, and we've got to fix that. It's just not right for patients to give them an autoimmune storm and not know if it's going to help them or not even know how to measure if it's helping. So now let's talk about data. And of course, if we're talking about data, we have to talk about my Uncle Tom. My Uncle Tom is what you think of when you think of Arkansas. <laughs> you may not look at me and think, oh, he's from Arkansas. Most people think I'm a Jew from New York. <laughs> not kidding. How do I know that? Because I'm Lebanese. <laughs> My grandparents were Syrian refugees a century ago, and trust me, it's not better today. Okay? So I'm Lebanese, but my father's father changed his last name, or he changed his name from Saliba, which means follower of the cross, it goes all the way back to the Crusades, to his middle name, which was Saman. Well, Americans don't do Saman, so Saman became Simon. So I've been getting anti-Arab jokes from my Jewish friends for years. <laughs> and invited to all the, you know, the bris and the... I always am very polite, but it was very, it was difficult when I was a professional musician. And I never actually met my agents in person. But they all wanted to tell me Arab jockey jokes. Um, and it was, it was, uh, it was tense. <laughs> Put it that way. Um, we're all Semitic. So it shouldn't be as tense as it is, but that's another option. Um, so my Uncle Tom was a lifelong bachelor. He had a stiff leg from a car wreck. He had a slick head before it was cool and a big egg-sized bone. And he started every sentence like this, whoop. So he'd come over for Thanksgiving dinner and he'd say, whoop, how you doing, Greg? And I'd say, great, Uncle Tom, how are you? Whoop, I'm fine. Not making this up. I live this. I am from Arkansas. So he was a hoarder of the first class. He had a duplex apartment with just him in it. Actually, it was a, he had a house where he was born next to the duplex where he spent most of his time. Both places were to the ceiling. And I'm not making this to the ceiling. The toilet, the bath, the bed, the kitchen sink. I have no idea where he did his daily business. It was to the ceiling with stuff. He would go out at night and find stuff and bring it home, right? So when he died and we started, my sainted mother started clearing things out one dumpster at a time, we would, you know, it was garbage, garbage, garbage. Oh my God, here's my father's ticket home from World War II on the Queen Mary. Garbage, garbage, garbage. Oh my God, here's a letter my grandfather wrote to every member of Congress during the Depression to support cotton subsidies to get the South out of the Depression by giving farmers money. Garbage, garbage, garbage. Oh my God, here's my father's gun and his duffel bag and a bag of bullets from World War II where he dropped it when he came home and nobody moved it for 60 years. <laughs> my family was not the cleanest of the world. <laughs> my mother mailed me my dad's Colt 45 and the bag of bullets. <laughs> in a box through the mail <laughs> in 2003 <laughs> did that make you feel good? 
I opened the box and there's a Colt 45 and a bag of bullets. I was expecting a ransom note. <laughs> so why do I tell you this story? Well, as you know, those are pretty valuable things in my family history that were in there. And my Uncle Tom was truly crazy. He, he, he was the guy that my uncle, my grandfather used to collect rents. Pretty smart. <laughs> have a hoarder correct, collect your rent. You don't have to worry about embezzlement. <laughs> Our institutions in medicine are all my uncle. <laughs> the information, just like my uncle, is born there, lives there, and dies there, and never goes anywhere. It is to the ceiling, metaphorically, in every institution. When I tell you about my uncle, you think that's crazy. When I tell you that about your local hospital, you go, well, that's policy. <laughs> okay, it's crazy policy, all right? We are hoarding information because that's been our culture. And we have all the good reasons in the world. Tenure, publication, Nobel Prize, you name it. My uncle had good reasons too. He wanted to keep it all. <laughs> Simple reason, right? Oh no, we can't, we can't throw any of that away. So your institutions are my uncle and you need to commit them somewhere. They need to change what they're doing. So there are several things we're doing that are, because Sam mentioned in the introduction, that combine urgency with respect for patients. Because that's, that's the two things that we need to do. For one thing I mentioned earlier about the knowledge commons, the knowledge commons is half empty without the patients. We're just now starting to use real world evidence. What the hell were we using before? <laughs> I'll tell you, we were using the human equivalent of the purebred white mouse. You find people with one condition and nothing else. And you say, you know what? You're gonna be in the trial and nobody else. I have two conditions, I'm screwed, right? For that glaucoma. So number one is we've got to create a way to share data from patients as well as to patients because otherwise our knowledge commons ain't common. And it ain't knowledge either because it can't be turned into practice. The regulators need this because how are they supposed to judge after a drug's approved who should use it? If the evidence we got before it was approved was so narrow that we find out, oh, it's not good for African Americans, or it's not good for Asian Americans, or it's not good for people with this mutation or that mutation. We don't want to find out the way we do in cardiology that all these healthy women are dying of heart attacks in the parking lot after seeing the doctor because doctors didn't see of women compared to men and didn't see signs of a problem. How long did it take us to figure that out? Now, the government, the Office of the National Coordinator and CMS have put out some new rules recently, which are on target. They're about creating better standards, creating better capture, and making it easier for patients to use the same kind of apps we use every day to get their data. The problem is that's a rule that will take years to implement, and I guarantee you, Epic and Cerner and all those other people aren't just going to say, oh great, yeah, let's do that and change our business model, right? <laughs> That's not going to happen. So we have done something, we're part of something called M-Code, which is uh, about common data elements in cancer. Imagine that we've got all these people with cancer and we don't describe their cancer in the same way every place we see it. So we need to have a set of common data elements that everybody uses, simple as that sounds. CancerLink and the consulting firm MITRE are running this. The FDA is involved because if we had common data elements, they would have a much bigger pool from community cancer centers for regulatory quality data, which would improve their work to improve our health through knowing more before they approve anything based on a disparity, a diversity of sources for the data that we think is so important. So I've, there are two action steps at this stage of the game about the data sharing world. And trust me, I know people who still say, say to me today, it won't make a difference. I know how to treat my patients. I don't need to know how they're doing it in St. Louis. Well, that's just wrong. You know, nobody ever says, 
I hate to tell you this, but your money has cancer. We know where your money is every day, every second of the day. You get regular reports about your money every month or every quarter. Every time you buy or sell something, you get a report. We know more about your money than we do about you. And guess what? You know more about your money than you know about you. Because all this health data doesn't have the transparency of financial data. So the first thing we're asking is that the cancer centers, and this is an ask for you, is to go back to your institutions and have them sign up to the MCODE project to adopt these common data elements without somebody making them, dictating it to them, or making them pass a regulation to do it. It should be the way it is done. Simple thing, cancer data elements in pediatrics, in adult cancers, in general. It is not that hard to do, but it does require something that's important, which is all the EHR companies use as an excuse their customers saying, this is how we designed it for our hospital. If we change it, people will die. I've actually been told that. Oh, people will die. If we have to change our record system, something will go wrong and someone will die. Well, if your system's that delicate already, you have a bigger problem than changing it, right? <laughs> Seriously. So the first thing is, can we agree on some common data elements? Can we agree on some common data elements? But here's the big ask. And my team hates it when I do this because I'm, I've been in government long enough. To, I, I love public service. I'm a big fan of public service. Kathy and I met in 1985 when we were a group called the Clone Heads. That was not a scientific term. It was a comedic skit on Saturday Night Live because Kathy on the Ag Committee, me on the Science Committee, and my friend David on the Judiciary Committee, and our friend Leslie on the Energy Committee we're all doing hearings about this new thing called biotechnology and genetic engineering and bovine somatotropin and how are we going to regulate gene therapy and what are the ethics of all this stuff. So Kathy has been a public servant her whole career. I've been a public servant half of my career. But sometimes we don't need to wait for the government to tell us to do the right thing. So here's my proposal for what's the right thing. Can we reverse the presumption? And instead of telling patients, you have a right of access to your data, it's your data, and you should ask for it. If I told all of you that, you may know how to do it because of what you do every day, but ask your mom if she knows how to do it. Let's reverse the presumption. Every health provider should be providing their medical records periodically to their patients after every event with an annual summary with an initial dump of everything you have on your medical record in a digital format that you can give to somebody who's going to manage it for you the way Mint manages your budget online or tracks your investments. Trust me, if 300 million Americans all of a sudden had their medical records online, there would be so many businesses pop up to help you understand it and manage it, where to put it for a clinical trial, uh, matching where to put it in a registry for a population study or a longitudinal observation study. But that's not how we do it. We say, you know better than I do, which is easier to design? A system that automatically, like a financial company, spits out your record when something is new and gives you a summary of it through your life automatically as an obligation or a system that has to respond to thousands and thousands of random requests some of which look like ransom notes, and some are emails, and some are telegrams. Which would you rather design, really? A system to respond to all that, or a system to do it? And so my challenge to you is, can we do it? Can we just stop this ridiculous debate about why we don't give patients their records? Do you know when Vice President Biden met with Epic and Cerner and all scripts and everybody else in the White House, Judy Faulkner from Epic asked him, why do you even want your medical records? I lean back. <laughs> I lean back. I, I, I know when you, it's going to get rough. My, my goal when I meet with, with Biden with the pharmaceutical industry is that everybody leaves the room at the same time. So I lean back and he said, none of your business. It's the right answer, isn't it? None of your business. So you get the point. I'm, 
I'm, gonna, I'm hammering a nail in front of you when you guys are, have all the hammers in your hand. So uh, let me finish with this thought. A televangelist named Robert Schuller was a very quotable guy. And one of his quotes, which I really like, and I'm a lapsed Presbyterian, so this isn't a religious statement. What would you choose to do if you knew you could not fail? What would you choose to do if you knew you could not fail? Now, I hope all of you are already doing that. So how do you get to the point where you know you cannot fail? So I'm a really bad cellist, but I know a really good cellist, Yo-Yo Ma, whom I met when I was looking for Gore because they were college roommates. And I've gotten to know him over time and always asking for cello advice, which is kind of like me asking, you know, Derek Jeter for hidden advice. <laughs> you know, everybody thinks practice makes perfect. How many times have you heard that? How many times have you said that? It doesn't. Practice makes permanent. Only perfect practice makes perfect. If I practice the piece wrong, I learn it wrong, but sometimes it's easier to practice the easy parts and not practice the hard parts more. That's not perfect practice. That's how you end up not doing well. So to practice perfectly, you have to do the hard things right. Which leads to the other line he gave me, which is amateurs practice until they get it right. Professionals practice until they cannot get it wrong. You're professionals. We need you to practice perfectly and get it right to the point that you cannot get it wrong because you can't fail. You're the group that's pulling all this together. You're the group that's the bridge between a patient who's just been diagnosed with cancer and whatever hope they may have. That's you. You may not think of yourself that way, but that is you. The friends of that patient can only do so much. The doctor is busy and gives them 15 minutes. The nurse is swamped taking care of these people. The information that we need to become knowledge and wisdom, you know how to deal with it. You know how to verify it, put it in context, make it real. And when we did the moonshot, I was asked by some reporter, why would you take a job that's only nine months? And I said, first, stop talking to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, you know, nine months is a pretty long time. Time for a baby. A year of school, it was half the life of my friend Alex. It was a quarter of the life of my friend Bart. It's plenty of time to get something started that won't be finished. But if you don't start it, what are we doing? So that's my challenge to you. No matter how long you think it would take, it's worth it to start it now because we need you not to fail. And if you're not going to fail, we have to stop practicing the way we've always practiced, which was imperfect, and figure out what we need to change to make it perfect so that we cannot get it wrong. Thank you all so much for your attention.